Please pray and consider sowing a financial gift today to help keep spiritual encounters reaching the world on Fringe Radio. Simply go to the Upper Room Fellowship and Casper McLeod Ministries, theupperroomfellowship.org, and look for the donate button down on the right side of the page. If you would like to hear more and have Pastor Casper minister at your church, please go to the top of our page and click on Contact Us link. If I could put on the mind of Christ, I would see you in the bitter light. I know before the world was made, how everything's gonna be alright. I never worry about anything. Because the peace of God is what I bring If I put on the mind of Christ I'd live in His glorious light If I put on the mind of Christ There'd be no darkness left in me If I put on the mind of Christ I would walk in faith never sight This is Pastor Jeff Farster of Freedom's Light Church of God. I want to invite you to an exciting prophecy conference. That is, if we're still here and the rapture hasn't happened in September. But it will be held October 23rd, 24th, and 25th at Freedom's Light Church of God in Ball Ground, Georgia. It'll be an exciting time. Guest speaker, L.A. Marzuli, Casper McLeod. And just at it, Chief Joseph Riverwind. And Bill Flynn. Come hear what God's Word says about the unprecedented times that we are living in. Hope to see you there. If not, I'll see you in the air. God bless.
Welcome to another edition of Spiritual Encounters, and I'm your lion-hearted host, Pastor Casper. Got a really exciting show tonight. Um, my guest is Jim Williamson, and he's no stranger to the strangest things that confound and perplex this world. Now, Jim was a friend of the late and brilliant researcher David Flynn. And Flynn, of course, was one of the first pioneers in explaining the UFO alien phenomena from a biblical perspective. And that's what we're hoping to do tonight. Jim also uh, lived near the very questionable Area 51, the UFO capital of America. And he's also an author of such books as Beyond Science Fiction. And he's a radio host as well as an ordained minister. You know, in the scriptures it tells us, in Proverbs 25, 2, it's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out the matter. So I, I know that one of the big questions going on with everyone right now is um, what's actually going to happen in September 2015? In the midst of all those searching out clues, you know, with the rapture and the revealing of the Antichrist, along with blood moon mania and uh, the Nephilim hunting and all the paranormal things going on, UFOs, and let's just face it, scientists gone stark raving mad at CERN. It seems to me the obvious things that, that many watchmen on, on the wall have concerns about is how these things are really unfolding prophetically. With, you know, we've got proceedings with the United Nations announcing Pope Francis is going to come and address the annual UN General Assembly of World Leaders the 25th of this September during his visit here, which is really you know, a, a first in his, historically. Um, so I think, you know, you think about it, what kind of power has um, its present that, that, that attracts um, people helping summoning demons to like places like Bahumian Grove? I mean, what sort of power brings kings and queens and presidents and all these world leaders and leases to participate in such activities in one place at one time? But all I can really say about it is, here comes the Pope, do, 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 here comes the Pope, and I say, so um, this is going to happen really, friends, you know, that he's going to come talk to the Congress, maybe some significant changes happen, and um, as he's the head of the, the Roman Catholics, he's going to address the Congress in America, and of course, he'll have a, a meeting at the White House with President Obama, nudge, nudge, say no more, so... Um, what are we really going to see here unfolding on a global scale? This might be part of the fulfillment of ancient prophecy, um, establishing maybe the new world order they've been talking about for some time. It's no longer conspiracy theory, is it? So how this is going to all play out, um, you've got stuff going on with the banking system and the Illuminati agenda and all the rest of it. And let's not forget that the Warburg brothers were part of the controlling banking families, the Federal Reserve System, the banks, influence both sides of World War II. Isn't that amazing? One brother financed the Nazis and the other brother financed the Allies. So I'll tell you again, the only hope for this world is, is, is Jesus, Yeshua. It says in Luke 26, 31, Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. Welcome, Jim Wilson. So good to have you here tonight on Spiritual Encounters. Thank you for having me. So you've, you're into the paranormal. God's used you mightily in the place. You've been helping people that have suffered, victimized by alien abductions. Um, you're understanding some of the naughty time travel thing with the aliens and <laughs> the sin connection or the, the devil's triangle. I mean, I think people are really going to want to hear about that tonight. If it's so, out of the box, I've probably already been there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so just go for it, man. Just start, start sharing with us. What, what, what brought you into this arena? Um, probably because I myself was a victim uh, of abduction, probably from when I was five to about uh, 12 or 13. But that would take you back to 19... 56 on up to about 1963 or 64 when when everything you know came to an end as far as that experience but growing up you know i just i got older and i just thought this were uh an overworked imagination of kids the boogeyman under the couch or in a 
you know, in the closet or something. And, and it was just normal stuff that other kids went through. Um, but you know, I, I've never, the Lord's never had me do anything mainstream or normal. I've always been kind of outside of the box yet. My faith, my beliefs are, you know, solidly anchored on the core. But, um, when I did get saved, I was uh, 23 years old. Three years later, I found myself, uh, pastoring one of the nation's first evangelical Christian motorcycle clubs, um, in the Detroit metropolitan area during a biker war. So that was rather interesting times to even come on the scene on that. And, uh, from there, uh, and actually in 19, from, I've had a lifelong fascination with UFOs and kept up with it, news clippings, and followed it just up until about in the 70s. I uh, went into the Army. I just kind of got busy with uh, all the earthly things uh, going on during the Vietnam War. And, and uh, But I remembered uh, what kind of pushed me away, I lost interest, was when it became kind of a less of a scientific exploit and it was getting off into metaphysics and and stuff and i grew up on darwin so you know when it started becoming spiritualized even though it was new age i just lost interest in the whole topic but uh when i became a christian in 1974 i was concerned with what i knew as a reality of ufos and how that fit into my new faith so i had kept it in prayer and from the time in 1974, zooming up to 1976, at that time I had been called into uh, starting uh, the motorcycle ministry. And my background when I was a teenager, I got involved in drugs and the biker lifestyle and had my first Harley in, I think, in 1968 and got into a whole lot of trouble real quick. Like, um, So the Lord has brought me back full circle first mm-hmm having a, an evangelical Christian bike ministry, and then uh, going from there into, of all things, the UFO and alien uh, phenomena. Yeah. I gave my first sermon to my congregation in 1978 on Genesis 6 and how that was was going to play over to uh, the whole UFO alien thing. And, of course, in 19, in 1976 or 78, rather, uh, Probably five or six people on the whole earth even understood uh, the Genesis 6 paradigm. And I explained to my congregation then that, you know, when I heard of abductions or the same activity going on in Genesis 6 again, then I would probably have to get more involved in it. But at the time, I was more mainly focused on the, the bike ministry. But it was mm-hmm. through that and working and developing and understanding uh, deliverance and deliverance type ministry that was helping me to prepare for when I was called in 1996. I had a dream and, and the Lord was calling me into a, uh, this type of ministry full time. He told me to start fasting and praying and, and seeking him and he would start showing me uh, things that were going to be disturbing and they were very disturbing. When I first started understanding in depth more of the Genesis 6, how that played out today, um, it was disturbing because it overturned and overruled a lot of things that I had been taught in Bible college. Uh, so I had to face the realities. And as I would get dreams or visions from the Lord and he would show me something, it was mainly to show me a different perspective of looking at things that I was about to study and learn in the scriptures. And then the Lord literally walked me through the scriptures, showed me different uh, things and how they pertain to uh, the modern day events. I had been mentored at an early age as a Christian into the ancient Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And uh, I've ha- I had several mentors uh, in that uh, along with my Bible college. So even though I lack a PhD, I-, I am able to study the word on that kind of a caliber on that basis, which I hope I faithfully done unto him right up until today. So, so in 19... 19- in- Go ahead. Well, I was- I, I'm just thinking some of our listeners might not um, be that well versed with Genesis 6 and the Nephilim connection. I'm, I'm guessing probably a lot are because you wouldn't probably be listening to Fringe Radio unless you were um, interested in, in, in understanding this more. But I was thinking maybe if, if it's not um, difficult for you or traumatizing, maybe you can talk about your own experience that you mentioned Oh, yeah. um, or maybe share with us, because you've done a lot of ministry with people that have been victimized and abducted against their will. 
yes. on how you would maybe um, encourage somebody that's listening, that's gone through that, um, that they might too be um, set free, made free in, in the almighty name of Yeshua? Yeah, there's, uh, there's many different things that can indicate um, that you might have had an abduction experience if you've had a lost sense of time um, while you were witnessing or actually seeing a UFO. And in my case, I never actually had a sighting and then an encounter. Um, I had been fascinated by the outer space. I had my own telescope, and I used to look hours up into space and and kind of wondering, you know, are you guys up there? And if you are, are you friendly? Are you going to come down here and eat us? Or are you going to, you know, help us out? Um, being a baby boomer, and it was a constant threat of nuclear war, you know, back in the early 60s. And this was something that was on pretty much everybody's mind. And it was on mine. And I wondered if we would end up getting help from extraterrestrials. So in my own crazy way, I had opened up a door, uh, not intentionally uh, opening up a door for demonic influence or anything but you know i had no background or understanding of christianity of of the things that god warned in his word so here i am just um you know talking in the empty space wanting to know if they're there and if they were you know show show yourself well you know uh unprotected ask what you want and, and satan is going to be right there to supply you with it and so i started having dreams of flying i started having dreams of uh what i call science fiction dreams um, of being in a, a spaceship, I had uh, my abductors were not the scary grays and all the horrendous medical things. From what I can remember, it was mainly with the Nordics. Uh, they were friendly. They were uh, sometimes picking me up at very inconvenient times. I remember one time I was being told to turn a box inside out with my mind, and I was arguing with them that it wasn't fair. I needed to be home. I had a big test in school tomorrow. I wanted to get good grades to get a good job on and on and on. So I, you know, became kind of a uh, conflicting pain in the neck for them, I think. I'm what they call a throwaway. Uh, right around 12, 13, uh, it, I just stopped having the, you know, these dreams. And I call them science fiction dreams. I knew that I would get one ahead of time because I would hear a ringing in my ears and I would think, uh-oh, I'm going to have a, the, a more science fiction dreams tonight. And I remember at first that sometimes they were exciting, sometimes they were scary. And the scary part was because before I was actually in a ship or having any dialogue with any entities, uh, at the foot of my bed I could hear whispering and what I would call the shadow people. You never actually saw them, only just outside of the peripheral vision of your, you know, of your eyes. And I could sense that something was there, but I didn't know. And usually I was so scared I would throw the covers over my head and then I would go off into a, like a dreamlike state. Mm -hmm. uh, but they put me that way or whether I was just that scared, I really don't know. And then I would have the, the dreams. Um, some of the after effects, I had nosebleeds continually. Um, I had uh, sometimes anxiety for no apparent reason. I don't know why. Um, sleepy, you know, at, at, yeah. at school because I'd probably been up all night long. Um, there's a lot of I, there's a lot of things with, with dreams. I mean, the, the scientifically, I mean, the, the different bio, you're in a different biological biochemical state. I mean, um, and evil needs ignorance, you know, to, to thrive in, right? Mm -hmm. just, just like fish need water to, to live in. Um, so neurochemically, when when you're awake, you have specific amounts of serotonin and neoephrine and that help you line your thoughts up logically and um, process, you know, all the sensory input coming from the outside world, just as we are doing right now. And then you get this burst of um, different chemicals, that, you know, that capture your attention. So when you sleep, it's, um, it's uh, you see, uh, colon production is, it's, it's, um, it's very active. It's, it's helping sort out, through, you know, con sort of consolidating all the memories of the day it's picking out what's important and disregarding what's not. Then you got those glycol cells that are coming, kind of pruning off the stuff that you don't need, um, which is probably one of the reasons, you know, science is going, well, it's this production of uh, serotonin, neoephrine that's shutting down. Um, that introduces an element of peculiarity in a dream. So it's kind of like a, you know, a dolly painting. It's all surreal. But you're basically saying there's something else going on here. And the scriptures obviously talk us, you know the, the the Lord uses dreams and visions to to, to convey a message. Um, sure. So it's possible you were getting the message from the wrong 
Kingdom? Well, I what they do, one of the biggest tricks that the um, fallen angels do is they, after you've actually gone through the experience, they implant into your own mind the fact that you're just dreaming. This isn't real. You just had a dream. That's all it is. And this is their best way of uh, covering up the traumatic experiences. And it's just all suppressed into your subconscious. So when I am working with a person to help bring them up, to uh, face what really happened, I let it totally be up to God. I don't try to, mm -hmm. I don't use hypnosis. I won't do anything to bring. Well, out. It just opens up another door. So. <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah. it's a person's mind in a passive state. Yeah. You want the person to be in a passive state. You want them to be continually active. So what I do is a, a form of inner healing. Um, I bring the person before the Lord. I ask the Lord to speak to that person's heart, to their mind, and bring out the things that they do need to know. And whether it be even things unrelated to the actual uh, abduction event, where were the doors open? What lie had they bought into that allowed them to succumb to being trespassed like this? That's really the root of the problem. And many times that's um, hurts, fears, um, situations of trauma that happen that's totally unrelated to the actual event. Um, and so I don't really even focus on the actual event unless there's something that they need to know and it has significance to them to be healed. Then um, we don't even open up a whole scenario of what happened, you know, minute by minute, detail by detail. The details that we know only are what needs to be known for the person's sake. I think sometimes um, people ask, maybe not intentionally but they're intrigued themselves they think that somehow putting this person in that state they can dig out interesting uh tidbits that'll make interesting pages in a book or something i i don't know but i avoid all of that it doesn't matter it's you know i had one person interviewed i was interviewed and they were disappointed that i couldn't tell them all the chilly details of uh m many individuals and what they went through it's because Apparently, the Lord didn't think it was that significant for them to know that. The most important thing for them to know is to how to be healed from the wounds and the hurts, the lies that they bought into that allowed this mm -hmm. experience to happen in the first place. Most people, however, there is enough that is rather interesting, but I don't get into the details. Um, that's, that's the Lord's job. If it's needed, we can know some of these things, but in most cases, it's not. It's, it's the hurts and the individual that needs to be known, and that takes us off to other directions that I have nothing really to do with uh, aliens or UFOs. Some cases I've had, it's almost been a, a generational curse. I had one woman who, um, whose father was uh, part of uh, uh, the Blue Book Project. He worked as an officer for the Air Force, and he was involved and interested in this. And his interest, though, was not necessarily um, directed or in line with the Word of God. He wasn't a Christian. He was intrigued by, in, by the mystery of who these aliens were. So his investigations, unfortunately, brought a world of hurt for the rest of his family, which ended up all, all of them um, having poltergeist-type uh, experiences, supernatural experiences in the home, and then the one daughter, it, it took on a life of her own within her own mind as she pursued the same kinds of interests. And uh, all the way up to, believe it or not, she married a pastor. She was herself involved in deliverance. They were full gospel. They understood everything of the spiritual warfare. And yet she had an abduction attempt by these mantis-type aliens uh, she knew what to do to shut it down right away, but it, they would keep coming back. So she was being racked with a false guilt, like, oh, my gosh, where did I open up the door? How come these things are coming? What tell, did I tell people how to shut it down straight away. Yeah. I mean, if somebody's, you know, unfortunately um, suffering from this phenomena, how, how do they shut it down? Well, it's, it's a war of attrition. And by that I mean that you know, if you know your authority in the Lord, like she did, you can make the abduction process stop by rebuking them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and commanding them to go, and they have to go. But they may, if they continually come back, it means there's something of some kind of ground, something that they're standing on legally that think, makes them think they have justification or a right to uh, keep intruding. That's where it's 
up to me to work with the person to find out what these open doors were. What is the, the trauma that they experienced? What lie did they buy into? So when I say that, I mean uh, a trauma happens. Then that person will come to a, hear a voice will say, if you don't want this to happen again, you have to do this. You have to do that. Well, usually that's the lie you buy into that's unbiblical, unscriptural, and your, your thinking process, your natural reacting is going to be in a wrong way contrary to the Word of God. So you're still going to be subject to the laws, uh, spiritual laws of God, whether you know them, understand them, believe them or not. You're still going to be subject to it like uh, we all are subject to the uh, law of gravity. You jump off a cliff, you're going to fall, you're going to hurt. If it's too far down, um, you'll get killed. So it's the same kind of thing spiritually. So um, it isn't rocket science. It's not a, a something you have to go and get a Ph.D. to be able to do. I can generally you know, lead or guide somebody in a very simple form of prayer to f- dig these things up. Now, on my part, it's nothing I can literally teach someone else to do. You have to be called to this. This has to have an anointing um, where you're able to use many of the different gifts of God's Holy Spirit in tandem, working with each other. Uh, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning of spirits, working of miracles, uh, maybe even somewhat prophetic. All these things have to be working together. And, of course, your own life has to be in such a way that these gifts are free. But if you're going to have clarity to be able to utilize these for the glory of God, then you have to have that rightness with the Lord to be able to hear his voice clearly, to be directed uh, in the right kind of way. So it's it's not an easy thing. Um, it's kind of like plumbing. Somebody's mm-hmm. It's a dirty job and somebody's got to do it. So <laughs> right. <laughs> really want to know the de- details in the whole process. Well, you know, really that's what pastors do, right? Yes. They're, they're kind of like um, pastors, if, you know, the body, the body of Christ, the, you know, some of the hands and some of the feet and some of the women out there are probably the necks to turn the head and, um, but pastors are really like the intestine because they help you process food and get rid of waste. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and that's basically, that's the main bulk of it. You know, even in deliverance, which I, I know that uh, you're, you know, you have been a part of, um, the extracting of the demon part is, for Hollywood or whatever, I know I find in, in myself um, – that usually can be very simple if there's been enough healing, if there's been enough understanding of brought to the individual, then ac- extracting whatever trespasser might be there can be very simple because the ground has been taken away from them, the, uh, the darkness they worked in has been brought to light, and the whole process can be rather simple then, uh, just commanding them so the, out. On the, right, so the, the people that are being uh, made free... That have gotten come into a right relationship with Christ and used their authority have not been messed with again. I mean, they've they've gone really free. Absolutely, uh, Jesus totally said, "Who sure. makes free, you'll be free indeed." I I do want to ask you. You kind of alluded to different types of um, entities, you know, which I believe that they're inter- interdimensional. The the masquerading is just demons masquerading as extraterrestrials, but. Um, you said the, the, there are some that look like praying mantises and some that look like the, the typical greys that you know are so popular today in, in um, illustrations. And um, How many do you think there are out there? And, and can you give us some insight into the, the reptilian kind, or the reptoids or whatever, the, the, you know, the dracos ones? Yeah, the, um, there seems to be mainly like four, what I'd say like four main ones, but there's a lot of variations of those same uh, entities. I'd say that there's the Nordics, which are fully human. And it's, I find it interesting. They're all uh, large Caucasian, uh, blonde or red hair, blue eyes, um, anywhere from six to eight feet tall. Um, then there's the um, the grays, which are the dolphin-like looking bulbous head, huge eyes, little frail skinny bodies, um, which, by the way, the... the uh, Nakash, which is the word Hebrew word for serpent, uh, lines up five different points of description about the Nakash, lines up pretty good description of what a gray is in several places in the Bible and, and in one comment in the Book of Enoch, uh, the Ethiopic version, Enoch 1. Um, then there's the, um, the... By the way, do you, do you think it's possible that Enoch 
I mean, because it was really originally part of the King James. Um, do you think possibly that could be the book that Daniel was supposed to shut up until the end time? And now that it's, you know, it's just recently, well, with not maybe late 1800, somebody, you know, discovered it again and it's in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And Well, I was at a roundtable discussion with um, probably some of the best minds, you know, in the world on, on that very topic. They were talking about should, should the uh, Book of Enoch have been added to the canon. And, um, you know, I'm not a PhD by any means, but... Um, I, they invited me to the roundtable discussion, so that means I had an equal say in voice. So I, I just kind of raised my hand. I said, excuse me, but guys, you know, I, I really think God is big enough that he controlled his word, and everything we have is what's supposed to be there, and anything else is not supposed to be there. I said, consider a couple of things. For one thing, in 1947, when the Roswell crash happened, had we had the book of Enoch as canon, we would have probably known exactly what happened, what was going on. There's a deception put upon the earth. It has to happen this way. That's the way God's plan was on that. So I think that book was left out on purpose. As a time capsule, when it was needed, we would have it to understand at least the historical narration of it for, the, for that important information content. The other thing, though, actually, is that there's uh, four different writing styles in the Book of Enoch. For the entire book, uh, I'm talking about the Ethiopic ver version, commonly called uh, Enoch One. Um, obviously, and I don't think that Enoch wrote all of the entire book. There's a cutoff point there, and we don't know who it, what it is. When they were setting up canon, one of the things was proof of auth authorship, and they could not prove that in a book of of Enoch. Uh, like I said, with four different writing styles, what you start out with is probably originally what Enoch wrote, what you end up with, with all this um, analogy and animals and, and whatnot is just a totally different style, a totally different matter. So to be on the safe side, the uh, founding fathers of the faith, uh, when they were at the, the uh, council to determine these things, decided to set it aside and not allow it to be canon because they failed to prove authorship. Now, also, the thing that I think is also important and not a coincidence is that we ended up with New and Old Testament, 66 books in the Bible. Now, I think God had a specific reason why he limited it to the 66 books. Man's number in Gematria is six. If man attempts to interpret or do anything with the Word of God on his own, then he is, his touch upon the Bible, the Word of God, of 66 books, is an additional six. So you do the math, it ends up with 666. So I think it's the very spirit of Antichrist. So without the Spirit of God, you're not going to understand those 66 books. And I think in God's simplicity, he set it up that way on purpose. So I think that there's a lot that can be gleaned and taken from the book of Enoch um, as a companion to the Bible, just as we do with Josephus and his work, Antiquities of the Jews. But I, I personally don't think that it's canon, and I don't think it should ever be taught or put on the same equal level as the books that were recognized as being canonical. Going back to, um, were you just talking about different kinds of um, extraterrestrials that have been manifesting? Uh, do you think um, there's a possibility that Gray's uh, might actually be cloned beings? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that uh, in Genesis 3rd chapter, it talks about the serpent that uh, after what happened in the Garden of Eden, he would be made to crawl on his body, body, belly and eat dust all the days of his life. When you look at the Hebrew words, uh, Gashon, Al, Galak, um, let's see, what is it? Um, Gashon, and the Hebrew word actually means it's belly, but it's outside of the normal process. Now, back when the translators were translating this at any time, they didn't understand anything about cloning or uh, anything like that. So, you know, they're looking at, okay, it's outside of the normal process and it's on the belly, so it's, he's crawling on his belly. And it literally, what is more, can be more accurately understood now in light of modern technology, as those words are suggesting or hinting that the whatever after the serpent did, that he would continue on his life outside of the normal process of birth. 
and that he would eat dust all the rest of his life. Well, the dust, athar, is the same word that mankind is made out of. There was one UFO researcher, uh, uh, John Lear, from the uh, Learjet uh, dynasty. He was an ex-CIA uh, member turned uh, UFO investigator. And he started proclaiming that he discovered that the, uh, the greys were actually eating us, the human beings, that when they were abducted. And I've had several cases of people that showed me this too, that, that, and I think I've seen the same thing in one of my more horrendous nightmare mm -hmm. dreams, uh, that they have a semi-permeable membrane similar to a frog, so they absorb uh, their, what they're going to eat through their skin. The rumor has it, the dreams seem to confirm this rumor, even my own personal dream that I had on one of them, long before I ever knew any of this kind of detail. Um, I saw them, the grays, soaking in vats of what looked like to be liquefied humans, humans that were put in these vats and liquefied, and then they absorbed through there. So they're literally eating AFAR, our genetic material. Um, the continuing on, crawling in the belly, has more to tell us that they continue their life by cloning. These are the very things that the greys confess that they do, that they no longer have sexual organs, that um, they continue themselves by transferring their consciousness into a clone body of themselves. This is how they perpetuate their life literally forever. Um, when the greys commonly understood through the secular UFO community, before Christians, before they were introduced to the biblical perspective in Christians, which I would say began around 2003 with the first Ancient of Days um, conferences uh, in Roswell, New Mexico, bringing together secular UFO researchers with uh, Christian re researchers. Um, before then, it was commonly understood that the Greys were far superior in intelligence, having two brains, able to... Uh, speak to us telepathically, able to freeze or suspend someone um, during a, we call it sleep paralysis now, you know, during an abduction. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, after the Christians presented this kind of information about the Nakash, about the, um, the serpent, then all of a sudden they started making the greys act like they were silly, redundant little robots or mindless idiots that would stumble and bumble around. And it was kind of, I think, a backpedaling. Uh, we've seen the same experience happen with the so-called Nordics. First, in the 40s and 50s, the Nordics were telling us that they came from Jupiter, from Venus, from uh, Saturn, and, and things like that. Now, in the 70s, they suddenly changed their address. Why? Because um, Voyager 1 and 2 took spectrographical analysis of planets, found out it was hostile, there no human could even exist on those planets and all of a sudden now the Nordics are from the Pleiades which is quite a far enough away where it's going to take a long time for us to <laughs> to to vet that one out so if, if you know we know now there's a difference you know before there's always a, like the Greeks had a, a, a differentiation between uh, time and space but then you know things changed and Things evolved, people theorized, and, and now we, we see time and space as Einstein, you know, showed it was being the same thing. So, what do you make of um, like Operation uh, Project Pegasus, where you've got several individuals that have come forward as whistleblowers, saying you know they were doing time traveling with the, the CIA and, and and the whole connection with you know NASA paper, Operation Paperclip. It's all connected here. In uh I think it's in Daniel 8th chapter, talks about uh, what has commonly been known as uh, one of the scriptures in reference to the Antichrist. It said that, um, and I just say it, it uh, to be on a looser term, I just say that the scriptures describe a person in the last days that would have a certain ability to understand certain knowledge. Um, this person uh, would hope to change times and seasons, and it would be given unto him a times, times, and a dividing of time. Um, that particular scripture, when you look back, when he determined or hoped to change times and laws is specifically what the word says. That word for times is used only one other place in the Aramaic, and that's in Daniel's second chapter where Daniel is singing the praises of God to Nebuchadnezzar. And it's saying that uh, for it is God who lifts up one and raises another down and, and uh, determines and changes the times and seasons. The two words there, times and seasons, and I don't know why they transposed it there, but 
the word for uh, times in Daniel is the word for seasons used uh, in the other place. And that same word, it means fixed appointed times. The other word means cyclic patterns like seasons or holidays. So the interesting thing on that word usage is that it means fixed appointed times. He would have a hope of changing fixed appointed times and it would be given to him. So whoever this individual is, he would also have a workable knowledge of the occult uh, to where he could actually produce something. That's in Daniel 7, when you, or Daniel 8. When you look in Revelation um, 13, this same individual, if it's the same individual, uh, has received military weaponry or an, a, a, a superior form of weapons of war through the occult. So if the two are the same person, there's another scripture that says that, uh, and this is the time stamp. This gives us mm -hmm. a time frame here. And that's in also where he understands dark sentences. He would destroy the holy people. And it says wonderfully. It means actually in a horrendous way. Now, when you go back to the Hebrew for holy people, that's very interesting because it literally means the descendants of the prophets. It means their offspring, their descendants. So we're talking about not God's people as my people. He's not telling Daniel that it's my people. He's saying the descendants of the prophets. Why? Because this is after 70 AD when Jesus said, because you have done this, the kingdom of heaven will be taken from you and given to a nation that bring forth the fruits thereof. Isaiah 55, 5, uh, some of the scriptures in Jeremiah, it's rather obvious that that's a, a vague reference to the United States, which gleaned all of this. And that's found in Daniel 11th chapter 40 third uh, verse, uh, literally where the, tab the, the tabernacle of his palace would be taken to the holy mountain between the, the seas. Uh, Israel isn't between the seas. Holy mountain has a New Testament reference. It's talking about a fortified, set-apart nation between seas. That's the United States of America. The very infrastructure of Nazi Germany was taken into America. This is where we got the t understanding of time travel. The Germans and Hitler was the first to understand uh, space-time way outside of the box. They're the first ones to develop uh, the technology of UFOs. They got it from the occult, their occult beliefs, and the same with uh, the ability to manipulate or travel time. They got that same technology from fallen angels through their occult beliefs. We gleaned the rest of it. They were the source, and unfortunately for us, it was just like Joshua and Caleb warned not to take the spoils of war into themselves. It would change them from within, and that's exactly what happened in the United States. We should have taken the same advice. We mm. took the infrastructure of Nazi Germany into ourselves. These people were highly educated. They were occult initiates. They, uh, the reason they discovered some of the technology they had, because it was outside of the box, it was uh, given to them by fallen angels, by their entertaining uh, the occult in occult means. And uh, it was uh, to our undoing. We literally took the very infrastructure of Nazi Germany into ourselves. They were connected to the old European monies. The, you follow the money trail, the same people that financed Hitler's uh, Nazi occult agenda and regime are the same ones that are in control of the United Nations, the same ones that are uh, movers and shakers within the New World Order. So what we so how do you see that playing out right now? Because I think um, with what little time we have left on this program, people are really concerned when we started off talking about what's going to happen in September. So how could you tie it all up for us here, you know? Um, well, you know, encourage people here. Yeah. Yes, the, the, uh, the thing that concerns me is where is your faith going to be September 25th if nothing happened? Mm. Nothing at all. Think about that. Just imagine if nothing at all happened. Just like pretty much 2012, you know, the Mayan calendar thing and everybody was geeked up. And, well, you know, remember Y2K. That was a good uh, one, that one. Yeah. <laughs> and the thing is that our faith has to be in Christ alone. We have to stay loosely knitted when in, in regards to anything that hasn't happened yet in the future. We just consider all things that are scripturally supported. Put them in the back of your mind. Put them in the quiver uh, of arrows and just be ready to use them as reference points. It may be a combination of five or six or eight different things. Um, for all the things that are predicted or prophesied that's going to happen September 23rd, I could give you, you know, there's going to be a, a, a pandemic, there's going to be a major earthquake, there's going to be a tsunami, there's going to be uh, volcanic activity, Putin is going to drop a, a, 
uh, an electromagnetic pulse weapon over the United States and invade it. Jade Helm is ready uh, to corral and round up people, the Pope and, and Obama, perhaps announcing the, the entrance or uh, the alignment with uh, aliens that are coming to help us out um, or some announcement that, you know, to gather the world together, there's going to be a required mark for world citizenship or, you know, all these things that everybody says is going to happen. The comet, of course, or the meteor that's going to hit Costa Rica and cause a tsunami. Um, you know, if you add up everything, it could everything happen that day? Yeah, it could. I, and I'm not saying that it isn't. Oh, and let's not forget the rapture, too. The rapture is supposed to happen then. Um, the likelihood of all these things happening at one time would definitely be phenomenal. I think that would be a an eye-opener awakening for everyone. But suppose nothing happened. There's going to be more people depressed, more people left like uh, felt like they've been cheated again or disappointed again. Um, some people that will never hear anything prophetic after that m moment ever again. They don't want to hear any of it. So this could be part of Satan's plan. And it could be part of the plan of God to help so-called watchmen, prophets, seers, whatever you want to call them, sharpen themselves and be a little more accurate. With the, uh, with the social uh, platforms that are out and available today, Facebook, Twitter, and all these other things, um, anybody and everybody is on an equal footing and format. We no longer, no longer does a prophet or someone with a prophetic calling have a measure of um, refinement, and being set up by the Lord and then be given the privilege or the rite of passage to have an audience to present their material. Now we got every Tom, Dick, and Harry prophesying and doing things, many of them immature, many of them not uh, tempered or taught by the Lord. Um, and maybe they have a real gift and maybe they really see something, but the clarity of what they see and how they see it or when they see it is all mixed up. We're, we are in such a confused cosmic mush of uh, prophetic utterances. I'm not saying that any of these people um, or any of these events aren't going to happen. Almost all of them in the Bible are going to happen. But all on the same day, on, on the same time, I rather doubt it. This event may be a big, huge non-event to refocus all of us on the person and not the event. Our faith can't be based on whether we believe uh, the rapture is going to be on the 23rd or Jade Helm or anything else. Our faith has to be that God is on the throne. He is in control. And whatever happens, he's still in control. And we have to, the, the thing that doesn't come natural for us, we just have to have patience and wait. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of a conversation we're going to have uh, September 25th, 27th, uh, as to what did happen and what didn't happen. Now, I'm totally open that, you know, let's say a, a comet hits, uh, it shifts the earth on its axis, it causes major earthquakes and volcanic activity in America, others see it, the dollar crashes immediately, Obama and the Pope immediately make some kind of a declaration of response, um, maybe the tail of the comet had some kind of a, a, a a virus in it that caused the pandemic. Um, you know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, the, the possibility that it all could play out one like dominoes, one causing the other, it could happen. And maybe that is what we'll see. But then again, I think the healthy, solid person, the Bible says that we will not know them by their symbols or their colors that they wear or uh, the words that they say. We will know them by their fruit. And the thing is, where in Daniel also, in the context of all the things that I just mentioned out of Daniel, it says, and they that know their God will be strong and do exploits. Mm. To know God means to know the mind of Christ. To know the mind of Christ is to obey Christ. It's to make him Lord and Savior of your life. The Lord said, my sheep hear my voice. They're going to follow me, know the voice we listen to. We're just about out of time. But um, tell us how people can get in touch with you. Uh, Okay, I have a lot of things going on the internet. I've got my website, echoesofenoch.org. That's E C H O E S O F E N O C H dot org or dot com. Um, every Wednesday night, I have a chat room on Pal Talk, Remnant Call. Um, you can go there and we talk about these different things. Um, and many times, you know, it's, it's, it's a mixed variety. The Holy Spirit depends on what we do. Sometimes we just sit there and pray for everyone. Sometimes we're ministering to people that come in and didn't know what they walked into because it is open to the general public. On um, 
Okay, let's see. On uh, I'm on Facebook uh, under my name, Jim Wilhelmson. I have 109 videos posted on YouTube under my name, too. Um, you can always communicate to me that way. My my email address is awitness41, that's A-W-I-T-N-E-S-S, the number four, the number one, at AOL.com. Um, first thing in the morning, I, I write and respond to everyone that ever writes or calls me. Um, I treat that as the most important thing and in, in aspect of my ministry. If you have a desire for counseling, I do counseling over Skype. Uh, we can do it with a video, and if you want, I prefer to, I like to look eye to eye to somebody face to face when I'm ministering, or we can do it by the phone also. I we can't do it by texting. I've had people that actually wanted me to do it by texting, and I no. At 64, my my fingers are too fat and spindly. I hit four numbers instead of one, and with my eyes, I can't see to text anyway, so I don't. Well. I'm sure people will be able to get in touch with you that the Lord sends your way. So um, let me just pray for everyone tonight that nobody would go away from this program in, 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 with the spirit of fear, but rather with the Holy Spirit and faith. And we just thank you, Father God, for this time together with Brother Jim. Thank you for blessing his ministry. Bless all that are on here tonight and all those listening that we take the truth of the gospel and we share it everywhere we can. We're a blessing to everyone, everywhere we go, that we go with in faith and that signs and wonders and healings and miracles follow us because that's your word. And so that's what we're going to continue in. In the almighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Messiah Yeshua, amen. So um, I do want to mention again, uh, if you're still here in October, and you're in the Georgia area, Atlanta, Ale Marzuli, yours truly, um, Bill Flynn, and Chief R- Joseph Riverwind. We're going to be um, at the Southern Appalachian Prophecy Conference in Ballground, Georgia, at Freedom's Light Church. And I'm sure that's going to pack out uh, pretty quick, so you might want to check that out and get a ticket straight away. I know uh, they tell me seating's going to be limited, but it'll be a, quite a weekend. It's always enjoyable f- to be with Ale and Chief Joseph. And I'm sure Bill Flynn is a bishop. He's going to have some, some fantastic things to share as well. Jim, thank you so much for coming on tonight. And um, I do look forward to getting you back on real soon because we didn't really get even to talk about your museum and Area 51 tonight. But let's do that next time. Okay. So uh, God bless actually, everyone. Actually, Casper, it wasn't Area 51. It was Roswell. <laughs> it was Roswell. Yes, it was Roswell. You, you didn't live at Area 51. <laughs> good, good call. I mean, I'm glad you didn't live there. So. <laughs> well, was, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, it was fun living in Roswell. I got to meet pretty much everybody who's who, secular and Christian in the UFO community. And uh, uh, it was quite an experience for the four years that I lived there. Yeah, well, lots, lots of stories, lots more things to talk about. And I'm sure there's a little bit more time left here. If not, we'll see you here, there, or in the air. So good night, everyone. Stay tuned for L.A. Marzuli, and we'll see you hopefully next week, God willing, for another spiritual adventure. God bless. Good night. Good night.